Welcome to this virtual roundtable where we will be discussing some of the key data that emerged from this year's ASCO meeting. I'm Hope Rugo, Professor of Medicine and Director of Breast Oncology and Clinical Trials Education at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today I'm joined by three expert leaders in their fields. Dr. Sarah Tulaney, a breast oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Dr. Jack West, a thoracic oncology specialist from City of Hope, and Dr. Shilpa Gupta, a genitourinary oncologist from the Cleveland Clinic. So uh, Sarah, there's some other uh, topics that were presented at ASCO that I think were important to us in clinical practice. There, of course, there was a huge amount of data, but uh, let's just talk about three different uh, areas. One was through our own consortium that we both belong to, which was really, uh, I think, interesting data looking at olaparib in patients who had other germline DNA damaging mutations or acquired somatic mutations. Really interesting in the metastatic setting. Uh, tell us a little bit about that trial we call olaparib expanded. Uh, by Nadine Tung. I know. I think this was actually a very exciting uh, trial that was presented. So this was a phase two study that took patients with metastatic breast cancer who had had up to two lines of chemotherapy for their metastatic disease, and they had to have either a germline mutation in a DNA damage response pathway or have a somatic mutation in BRCA1 or 2 or in other uh, genes um, that are in the DNA damage pathway. And what they found was that amongst those patients who had germline PALB2 mutations, and I will say these data sets are very small, uh, so there's only 11 patients in the, in the germline PALB2 cohort, but nine of them had objective responses and in fact, the other two had stable disease. Um, so it was really like an 82% objective response rate, which is something we really never see. Um, so I think very uh, impressive. And then in the somatic patients, the so somatic BRCA patients, we also saw um, that half the patients, so 50% of patients achieved uh, a response. So not that far off from what we see with germline BRCA patients with PARP inhibition. And so given these very exciting and promising data, um, the, Nadine is working to expand these cohorts, so to add more patients to the germline PALB2 and to the somatic BRCA to have larger numbers of patients. Um, but you know, I will be truthful seeing these data. If, if I had a patient and there wasn't a, a slot on a clinical trial, um, I would consider honestly prescribing a laparib to a germline PALB2 patient. I realize it's based on very small numbers, but it's just such you know, a startling response rate and, and biologically makes sense. And so it, it seems like it's, it's a really promising uh, treatment for these patients. I agree, and I think that you know maybe we could add the PARP inhibitors even earlier to one of my patients on this trial who had a fabulous response with PALB2 rapidly progressed in brain, you know, and maybe there'll be something that we can do by treating earlier to prevent that uh, rapid resistance and you know these protected slots. Uh, we learned uh, more also about uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. We've been questioning what the right partner is for CDK4-6 inhibitors in the first line metastatic setting. Uh, based on the prior FALCON data that suggested that ful fulvestrant in patients who'd never have been exposed to any endocrine therapy in any setting might be better than uh, a aromatase inhibitor uh, if you only had bone and soft tissue disease. So it was a subset of a subset. Uh, but the Parsifal trial addressed this. What did that tell us? Yeah, no, so I think we've been interested to see these data because of, as you alluded to, prior data suggesting fulvestrant may be superior to an AI. But Parsifal really looked to randomize patients in the first line setting to get fulvestrant with palbociclib or an AI with palbociclib and looked at uh, progression-free survival. And in fact, there was no difference between the two arms. So the progression-free survival numerically was a little bit greater for the AI plus palbociclib arm relative to the fulvestrant arm, but not statistically significant. And so they were not only not able to show superiority for, for for fulvestrant palbo over AI palbo, but they also were not able to show non-inferiority. And so, you know, I think to me what this shows is that while there's data to suggest when fulvestrant is given alone that it may be superior to an AI, 
that when given with the CDK4-6 inhibitor, the choice of endocrine therapy didn't really matter here. And so in truth, it doesn't really change the way I've been practicing to date in a sense that if I have a patient who um, comes in with de novo disease or maybe a couple years out from their adjuvant AI, then I think about using an AI in CDK4-6 inhibition. Whereas if I have someone who progressed on an AI um, in the adjuvant setting, then in the first line setting, I'm going to fulvestrant and CDK. So I think it does in essence confirm our clinical practice patterns that we're not going to change those. Um, but, but certainly interesting because it, it does suggest that there's something different when you combine endocrine therapy with CDK4-6. And I think we also saw some really interesting biomarker data that came out from other trials to suggest that maybe CDK4-6 inhibitors also suppress the SR1 mutations. And, and I wonder if perhaps that mechanism may be playing a role in, in the Parsifal results. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting because even people who'd been exposed to prior AIs, they had to have been at least a year out, didn't have any worse outcome, which we would have predicted if they had all these ISR1 mutations. But um, I think it's really interesting. And it also suggests that, you know, as we know already, if you're not actually progressing on an AI, uh, the rate of ESR1 mutations is relatively low. We'll see more data on that from Parsifal in the future, I'm guessing, when they look at the tumor tissue. But it's interesting. But uh, you know, one of the reasons why we like to use AIs is because it's an all oral regimen, of course, um, which is really important to patients, but also because then we can, quote unquote, save fulvestrin to, uh, for other partners. And one of the partner that has been approved in combination with fulvestrin other than CDK4-6 inhibitors is the alpha-specific PI3 kinase inhibitor, alpelisib, uh, which was approved in combination with fulvestrin based on uh, almost doubling of the progression-free survival in patients who'd progressed on an aromatase inhibitor and had a known PIK3CA mutation in their tumor. But uh, what's interesting about that trial, Solar One, is that it had it completely accrued, uh, almost completely accrued before CDK4-6 inhibitors became approved to treat uh, metastatic breast cancer. So patients had not received uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors, only a tiny number had. In that tiny number of patients, it looked like Alpelis had benefited uh, patients, but it's hard to say. So we designed the BILEAVE trial, which I presented at ASCO this year, and I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, we presented cohort A, which are patients who had progressed on a CDK4-6 inhibitor and an AI as their last therapy, uh, had a known PIK3CA mutation, and then were treated on study with fulvestrant and alpelisib. Our primary endpoint was looking at patients who were alive and without progression at six months out. And there are other cohorts that either haven't reached the six month uh, endpoint or are still accruing. The chemotherapy cohort is accruing. And I, I think that, of course, we also looked at progression free survival overall as well as the safety. And uh, as you know, what we showed was that uh, slightly over 50% of patients were progression free and well at. Uh, without uh, a major event at six months, which was compared very favorably to Solar One. Uh, and we also showed that progression free survival compared favorably, and that safety was a little better if you just look across trials comparing to Solar One, perhaps we hope due to experience and uh, knowing how to treat and prevent rash, for example, and treat hyperglycemia. And then in a real world comparison analysis using the Flatiron database, we showed that the PFS in Bileev was better uh, than what we would have seen with standard therapy in a patient cohort previously treated with CDK4-6 inhibitors and with PIK3CA mutations. Uh, so all of that was quite interesting. How would you uh, look back on this data and take it into practice? So I think it was really important data to, to see because as you allude to, I think there were only like 20 patients in Solar One who were post CDK4-6. So it's very nice to, to actually have real data for the way we're currently utilizing Alpolisib, which is really in a post CDK4-6 uh, space. And so I think what we're seeing is, you know, having a PFS over seven months to me is really pretty significant because we know fulvestrin when used as monotherapy in a patient with a PIK3CA mutation actually has a very short PFS with many studies reporting PFS of just about two months in some patients. And so seeing it being over seven months clearly suggests that alpolisib is adding activity to this patient population. And it's 40% of our patients with ER positive disease. So, you know, it's really a substantial uh, 
proportion of patients that can derive benefit from l -polisib. And I do think, as you alluded to, we are getting better uh, with dealing with the toxicities. And I think the data that you showed looking at antihistamine prophylaxis is really very important uh, because it, it really did decrease rates of grade three, four rash by about half. Um, and so that makes a huge difference in being able to keep people on drug. And that's why I think we're seeing better and lower discontinuation rates. I think you know, oncologists have never been the best at managing diabetes, uh, but I think we've learned how to now check screening hemoglobin A1Cs, check fasting glucoses, initiate metformin early. Um, and I think all these, you know, learnings are allowing us to better keep patients on treatment and allow them to see the benefit. Great. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. And uh, your thoughtful responses and reviews are great. Uh, thanks very much. We have so much more to talk about, uh, but we'll talk about it at another time. Thanks, thanks for having me.